Good afternoon and welcome to our uh, Bicon podcast. i delighted to be joined this afternoon uh, by Amir Mizrach, who's the um, EMEA tech editor for the Wall Street Journal, and Hugo Bieber, um, who is the chief executive of UK Israel Business. Uh, now, ahead of the Innovate conference that's taking place tomorrow in London, uh, we wanted to have a discussion to really get into the substance of what it is about the Israeli tech scene and Israeli entrepreneurship that is just so exciting right now, and what are the opportunities for, for British business. So if we could start off, uh, Amir, uh, what is it about the Israeli tech scene that, that's really propelled it to such global su- success? Well, I think I think there there are a couple of um, of points uh, to look at. The first first of all is the um, influx of um, of Jews from uh, from Russia. Right, it came in the nineties. I think that had a massive impact because really, really kind of high skilled, highly educated people. Um, the other thing, obviously, is the army and especially the computer units, the famous uh, A two hundred units that churns out more and more mm. um, people into the tech industry and these people are coming out with you know the latest um, in tech and the latest in, in ideas also and how to how to approach um, you know build something quickly see if it works mm. if it does great scale it if it doesn't move on I think that also a lot of a lot of reservists who go back into the army into a 200 and some of the other, some of the other uh, units also bring in a little bit more experience and actually have a positive impact on the on the army also so that kind of has a feedback loop mm-hmm. and I think that um, the other thing that, that people aren't really talking about that much is that there's a lot of Israelis abroad mm-hmm. in London in Silicon Valley New York and Boston and obviously they're studying at the universities but they're also establishing a lot of um, you know the kind of tech hubs mm-hmm. that they're kind of plugging into and this is cross-pollinating quite a lot so mm-hmm. so you really do see a lot of Israelis joining um, tech firms abroad, coming back and, and setting up, let's say, you know, the offices back in Israel or, or taking an Israeli office and setting up in New York. Right. Um, so they're everywhere. They're highly skilled. And um, yeah, I think I think that obviously um, the future looks pretty bright mm. uh, as long as Israel itself opens up um, to a little bit more diversity. In its tech scene, I think it's quite elitist. Mm-hmm. As you know, does the, the that army that army kind of um, uh, track is is good, but it, it also just keeps it to a very narrow type of uh, person. I think it would be really really good mm. if uh, the country opened up to more demographics. How can it do that? Well, first of all, it needs to try and bring in um, Arab Israelis, uh, ultra orthodox mm-hmm. Jews. And um, a lot of a lot of students and soldiers from the periphery, mm-hmm. who don't kind of get into the same schools um, that uh, people from the centre of the country uh, get into, and they in the centre of the country, you see, by the way, where where most of the startups are established. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, I think that Israel, you know, needs to attract uh, a little bit more foreigners, not necessarily uh, Jews, but non-Jews. I think that if you look around the tech scene in London, Berlin. Um, places like that, you see a lot of founders, a lot of software developers, designers coming from all over Europe, from South America, mm-hmm. even now a little bit more from Africa. And I think that that Israel, mm-hmm. sorry about that. I think that Israel, uh, you know, really, really lacks that mm-hmm. foreign diversity. I know that there's been a, a decision now to open up for uh, some visas, 50 mm-hmm. visas uh, a year, which I think is a good start, but is nowhere near mm-hmm. what Israel needs. Um, is there some something about also the types of applications that these companies choose to uh, develop? I mean, it's been mentioned that you know typically Israeli tech companies don't go for the kind of fluffy consumer app; they go for something that's much bigger, solving a big problem that's going to have universal application. Is is there some truth in that? No, it's complete. No, that's, that's not true at all. <laughs> like, I think I think that you have um, the uh, you have a lot of Israelis doing. You know, a, a, an entrepreneur, a founder, could have found yeah. five different companies until he gets something that yeah. that sticks. There's a lot of there's a lot of attempts at consumer apps, yeah. but it's also you have to understand it's a small market. It's yeah. a very very small market. So a fluffy consumer app, you know, if it if it doesn't catch on immediately, um, you know, with a hundred thousand people or two hundred thousand people straight away, mm. it's going to die, even if it's really brilliant. But if you look at some of the really, I mean, come in here, Hugo, tell us what you think. But if you look at some of the really really big ones, so you've got like. You know, ways which is absolutely universal, and it's about you know mm. something very simple about how do we get around 
a lot of the cyber security apps is all about this common problem which everyone's trying to solve. You look at things like biomed where it's about you know healthcare. These are very big problems um, that have absolutely universal application. Uh, I mean, is that a nonsense or is it? I mean, I think that a lot of the big businesses coming out of Israel at the mm. moment are not businesses that your eyes consumers face. Mm. They're businesses that are used in the background, mm. whether it's in advertising technology to monetize right. totally. you and me as we go and buy things and surf yeah. on the internet. And right. it's a lot of them are more in the background. Mm. Um, and some of the biggest businesses we're seeing at the moment are certainly more in that sector mm. than anything else. I mean, I think Waze was in some ways the outlier mm. there. It's one of the few massive consumer apps that has come out of Israel. Mm. I mean, I can't, there's very few and far between mm. otherwise that I can think of. Is it about investment in R&D? I mean, if you're in government and you're looking at the Israeli example, and you look at 4% of GDP being spent on R&D, you look at the number of engineers, I mean, is it as simple as other countries just looking at it and saying, double, triple, quadruple your R&D, and you'll get what Israel's doing? Or is it something much more complicated? Well, I, I mean, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I think that it's, it's great that 4% of, mm. of GDP is going to R&D. On the other hand, universities um, are facing a massive funding crunch. Right. You know, the Weizmann Institute and uh, the Technion, I mean, they're mm. still winning, you know, w w one or two, uh, you know, major prizes and Nobel prizes. But the, the, this is for work done in the 70s and 80s. Right. Right. And um, th there's a big problem in Israel now in terms of funding for universities and colleges and, mm. and, and that kind of stuff. But um, I think that a, a lot of the R&D mm. for the, the security, for the hardware, for the drones, for the uh, electrical engineering stuff, then comes out in, in companies also is in, in the, the military industries. Mm. So I think that if anything that, that countries can learn from Israel is that it's good to diversify. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have a great, um, you know, there's universities, there's colleges, there's also GDP for R&D, but there's also that there's military stuff, there's universities, mm. and, and you want to try and get as balanced a funding proposition as possible. I think on that subject, you can't ignore the role that the Office of the Chief Scientist does play, mm. and it will provide seed money essentially to companies. Mm. It's a bit like a government venture capital fund, except that it would invest in things and take a risk that mm. no investor would take and they actually don't necessarily see failure as a bad thing. Mm. And I know we've had, I've heard the chief scientist talk about an example of a company that was a massive failure mm. and it went bust. But out of that failure, 30 new companies came out of it and all the IP trickled down into new businesses. And so actually in the longer term, it was a success. And so I think that is one area where it really does, the government has a very different appetite to risk mm. when it comes to investing in and helping prop up and create this startup ecosystem that other countries don't have. And you know, you look at that money, it gets recycled again. The, the companies repay it through royalties mm. or upon exit. So it gets refunded and gets recycled around the ecosystem. Mm. Compare that with the UK and companies are given a grant. They don't ever have to repay it. So the British taxpayer never gets anything back in the longer term. So there's less incentive to fund companies through such a funding structure for more than a few years. No, that's interesting. In terms of the character of the Israeli entrepreneur and, and, and what that characterization can kind of teach the British entrepreneur, what are the kind of three things that I either of you think is like, what is it about the Israeli entrepreneur that is unique, that is interesting, that really propels them to success? You start. <laughs> like a dog with a bone. They don't yeah. let go. Right. I mean, I know an Israeli entrepreneur that was mm. working for a telco company. He was desperate to get his products into BT. Mm. The guy refused to see him, refused mm. to see him. He ended up getting into the building and sitting outside the guy's office all day. And at mm. six o'clock, the guy said, come on, you've been here all day. I'll give you two minutes now. Mm. And the guy ended up doing the deal. He sold him into BT because he had a good product, but they're relentless. Persistence. Mm. Well, I mean, the, the, that's true. There is that, that element. I think, I think that another um, element is perhaps less to do with an individual entrepreneur and more to do with, with the way Israel as a society mm. kind of functions, e even in, in companies and especially in the army, in, 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 in vast areas of the army. Um, the organizational structure is pretty flat, mm. right? So if you want to get anything done in Israel, um, you know, chances are that if it's a good idea and you elbow your way in mm. and get it done, you'll get it done. Even if it's a failure at the end, that's not really the problem. I think from my experience in the UK in the past two years and, and just, I'm just seeing, you know, not just in UK, but, but in Europe, there's very, um, it's very vertical, the structures here. 
you have to you know really kind of ask for people's buy-in a lot and you have to to navigate politically and um to to change the culture of a vertical hierarchical um and siloed organization is is very tough and i know a lot of israelis me included are very frustrated sometimes in big you know global um teams that you know we see a clear way to get something done but there's so many people in the way that sometimes you you kind of need an Israeli to step on people's toes mm -hmm. to get it done, um, and then they'll get a bad a bad rep, but but it gets done. So I think that you know it's good in the UK to have Israelis mm -hmm. or people with that kind of attitude to try and, and shake up that kind of vertical and siloed organizational structure, which um, in Israel um, it exists, but it's not as perva pervasive as it is in Israel. So if you have a very deferential culture, which is very hierarchical, and people will wait to be given permission to do something, right. that is very anti-entrepreneurial. It's, de it's deadly. Death. It's deadly. Where you need a culture where it's not as vertical, where people are not deferential, where they're questioning everything, right. they're constantly looking. Yeah. For I mean, it, the it can be a little bit extreme at yeah. times, and, and sometimes you know, you'll, you'll have a look at how Israelis do, do business and you'll think, oh my God, mm. you know, you people just tell each other exactly what you think of each mm. other and what mm. you think of each other's plans. <laughs> you know, on the other hand, on, on, on the British extreme, people mm. won't tell you at all what they mm. think. You know, it'll come out later on in some mm. sort of passive aggressive way. So I think that, that, that both, both ends are a little bit extreme, but if you find some, like a good medium where you have the, the British organization willing mm to loosen up, willing to see that there's a guy on the other side of, of, of the office who might have a good idea and is trying to break through, let him go, let him see, let's see what he can do. If it works out, great. You know, if it doesn't, you haven't really lost too much, I think. So tomorrow in central London, we've got this uh, Power to Innovate conference. We've got hundreds of British business people uh, coming together with Israeli entrepreneurs and Israeli business people. What is it that you know Israeli entrepreneurs and Israeli companies can offer you know British companies at the moment? I mean, where are the real opportunities, and, and what do we think you know British companies will be learning tomorrow? I mean, I think there's a few areas, and certainly cybersecurity is yeah. a very big topic, and it's an area where Israel, I think, probably has world class and is the world leader in that. And so that's a clear area where every British company needs good mm -hmm. cybersecurity, as we've seen with the Talk Talk hack the other week. We know that there is more need than ever before for things like that. Um, in other, in terms of other areas, I mean, I think fintech is another very big buzzword and Israelis are really innovating in the areas of alternative finance, like around Bitcoin, around colored Bitcoins and so forth. Um, and a lot of other areas as well within financial innovation. So, I mean, those are two key areas where I think that combination of London as a financial, as a world financial center, and Israeli technology are a perfect marriage. Mm. No, I agree. I agree with you. Um, and I'll, I'll go back to, to to what I was saying about you know a flat type of structure. I think mm. that that from from my kind of looking around at King's College and Cambridge and Oxford and um, UCL, there is a lot of talent here, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of talent in in cybersecurity here too, and in fintech and and data science and all that. There is the talent here. What's not here is is a kind of attitude of this is you know small agile teams even if you're in a big company and I think that the, the the best best thing that that the UK can take away from meeting Israeli companies is how do they actually operate mm -hmm. day to day logistically physically how do the managers what, what do they do do they micromanage do they do they let people go a little bit what, what is the way that, that they work and it, you can marry that mm. with the, the money and the talent and the diversity that you have here, I think I think that would be probably really good. Yeah. I mean, I know one of the UK's largest e-commerce retailers has partnerships in Israel. They will send members of their engineering team from the UK to sit in Israel for two weeks a year. So they come back with this mentality and come back with a different way of working in teams coding. Mm. So there are certain cases where that's already happening, but as Amir said, it's getting more Israeli sort of ingenuity and teamwork mm. into British companies. That's very interesting because that's very that's very managerial. That's very that's not about necessarily the smart ideas or the the brilliant ingenious piece of tech. It's it's about saying, um, you know, break people up into smaller teams, give them more autonomy. I mean, is it, is it as simple as that, or is it something else? I don't know if it's simple, but no. but but that, that's definitely a start. Yeah. I think that if you if you make 
all of your employees have a sense of leadership and yeah. give them the ability to float up their ideas. I know, yeah. I know there's a lot of companies in the UK, you're probably also um, aware of this, have these um, uh, uh, Office of, of, of Innovation, mm. an Innovation Chief Officer or something. Mm. I've never seen such a waste of money <laughs> in my life because these people then basically sit in their closed offices and they have to come up by themselves with you know with ideas to, to sell up to the CEOs. Mm. What you need really is a mechanism to unlock the ideas and the um, you know the ingenuity of people in your building. Mm. And and quite often you know with some different floors or different hierarchies, people are afraid to speak out because mm. they're worried about you know um, opening up themselves up to, to criticism and you mm. know to failure. And um, it doesn't necessarily have to be in a small team. It could mm -hmm. be a large team. But um, I think that in Israel, even small, small companies and bigger companies, there's just more of an attitude of, okay, I can own this idea mm -hmm. and I'm going to bring it to everyone, whether they want to hear it or not, mm -hmm. like the guy who said outside. Yeah. Um, and it's okay. It's okay if you do it and if it's okay, you know, if it doesn't, it doesn't work out. But you, you would rather um, be in the room and give your advice than, you know, just be overlooked. I think the one bit to add to that is the risk of failure mm. and people in Israel don't seem to mind about failure. It's almost a badge of honor. I mean, last week I hosted a panel and had an entrepreneur talking about his three failed companies. He's mm. now onto his fourth. That might be a success if he's lucky. Mm. And <laughs> four or five. But, you know, I think, yeah. but there is that <laughs> acceptance. You, you need, and they're much more open to failure. It's not a terrible thing. That is a, I mean, we know that's a big issue with, in, in British business is that people do talk about this fear of failure and you know, when a business goes bankrupt, it's almost like someone's almost in mourning, and you know, yeah. it's very, very well, hard. I agree with that. I don't think that's the. I don't. I don't. I don't like to 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 celebrate failure. Mm. I don't think. I don't agree with that at all. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that that is is the message, that, and that's what not what I see in, in Israeli startups anyway. I think that that you own your idea and you own your failure. It's okay mm. to fail. It's not the end of the world. It's not great yeah. either. You owe yeah. people money. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I'm thinking more in the concept of an idea within a company as opposed to the entire company. Right, yes. And that's yes. once you're a bigger company, you sure. can have your little sub teams yeah. that mm. are your skunk works essentially. And right. that's probably more the area where I'm talking about acceptance of failure. I mean, no, it's not good to have a bunch of startups hiring people and then going spectacularly bust losing investors' money and putting people out of jobs. That's not yeah, you've got to be careful. When there's a very say fine line. Failures. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Let's just dwell for a sec on on cyber technology and cyber security because there is there is a lot of talk about you know the Israeli sector and the, you know it's a massive growth area. You talked about you know there's really good expertise here. So what is it that that you know Israeli companies can can marry up with in Britain? I mean tomorrow we're going to have a session where you know the the uh, cyber security czar is going to be speaking and we've got one of the top Israeli entrepreneurs in cyber security. What what is that marriage? going to be like? I mean, what, what can Israel really offer Britain there? I think that unfortunately um, the hackers are uh, generally going to be a step ahead mm -hmm. of the uh, defenders and you can ask any real pro in cyber security and I think they'll agree. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the one thing that um, I think that the Israeli uh, industry can help here, especially with the, the financial services sector, um, is find ways of um, of sharing information between various actors here, whether it's government and security services and, you know, industry um, to, you know, what is the latest threat? Mm. Who are the latest bad people? Um, you know, if, 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 a, if a bank has been hacked, what did they use? Mm. Um, and how can we go and retrieve that? And I think that there's a lot of Israeli companies that have, you know, really good um, kind of connections, uh, whether it's algorithmically or you know through uh, through their industry contacts, into into what is the latest information that we can share to keep everyone safe. Because I, I I personally think that that's not happening enough mm. here in the UK. Mm. I think that that someone will get hacked, mm. they'll keep it to themselves, they'll right. call the police, and they'll try and work out how do we get out of this. In the meantime. The data that's been taken from them is being used in, in another attack and it just kind of goes on and on and on. So again, it's less it's less a technological you know, product or service and it's more an idea of how flat and how much can, can you share with, with the industry and if there are tools mm. to do that um, you know, without ruining your reputation and doing it you know, securely, that's what I would be looking for um, in any kind of you know, industry news. Do you want to add? 
Um, I mean, I think if you you can obviously start to look at the individual technologies and mm. the companies coming out of Israel, and you see a lot of you see them morphing from Israeli expertise in big data analysis being then used for cybersecurity purposes as well, and companies that are very good at actually both and using the knowledge of big data to find that needle in the haystack to sift through the thousands and millions of threats and attacks that a company might get mm. to find out actually which is the real one, which is the one that's got through, but we don't know. And I think you've got a lot of that technology coming through because I think certainly from a UK perspective, we're, we're good at cybersecurity. We've got some great British cybersecurity companies. Mm. I don't know on the big data side if we're quite there to the same extent. And a lot of this again comes back to the army and things like the 8200 unit and other units within the Israeli army where mm. People at the age of 18 spend their lives, or the, net, the three years of their lives, sifting through big data, trying mm. to find those needles in the haystack, and then going on to form companies mm. doing the same thing. So I think yeah. there's a lot of that. That's one of the big areas. You mentioned before that here we're very good in some ways at opening up lots of data, but we don't have enough people here that can sift through the data. Sure. I agree. I think that if, if, um, if the UK had uh, 1,000 Israeli data mm. analysts, data scientists mm. um, here on a you know, temporary or permanent or whatever kind of basis to kind of help companies deep dive into that, train people, mm. um, that is a sector that I think the UK desperately needs, is people who can source, mm. sift, and analyze big data. I don't, know, don't really know why. I mean, yes, the army in Israel is great, but you have great universities here. Mm. Maybe they're not focusing on that. There's big data engineers that we need. Let's look at a completely different area. What about biomed? I mean, it, it, people often are talking about the apps and the computers and all this kind of stuff. But what about the really clever stuff in biomed, which is a massive growth area? Let's talk about that. Let's talk about what the opportunities are that Israel can provide Britain. I mean, I think the first, what I, I'd rather flip it around and say, mm. what can Britain provide Israel? Right. And I think the first thing to think about is a single customer. Yeah. With the NHS, it's a lot simpler. Well, once you can navigate through the NHS, mm. you have one customer as an Israeli company to get into, yeah. as opposed to other markets where, say, the US, you're going to have to deal with hundreds of individual hospitals and health mm. insurers and groupings of hospitals. So if you've got the right technology and you can get it through, all the approval processes and everything else, and it's not a quick process. Mm. You have one very big market, and I mean, I think you look at Teva, the mm. Israeli pharmaceutical giant, they've managed that over the last few decades, and are the um, largest supplier of generic medicines to the NHS. I believe provide about one in five medicines in the UK. So that's, I guess, on the pharmaceutical side, within biomed, you're seeing a lot of Israeli innovations, and I think, also that morphing together of technology and medicine to bring together more around connected devices around telemedicine and those sorts of areas so mm -hmm. i think there are significant opportunities for both countries it's not i think it's really a benefit for both right yeah i agree i think um i think that again big data is 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 the kind of key that that holds us all together i mean you have a lot of research opening up and you have you know, all this health monitoring stuff mm. and, and wearables that are going to move away from just the consumer funding into health research. And I think that, you know, if, if you can get all this NHS stuff and everything that's happening in Oxford, by the way, you know, which is a, um, an incredible place for life sciences and biomed, mm. if you can move a lot of that data to, you know, data analytics companies and they can help with that, then then you're probably, you know, hopefully going to make some breakthroughs in, you know, in science and, and stuff like that. The conference tomorrow, who, who are you most excited about hearing from? You know who's speaking. Who, what's your top person that you're thinking, wow, that's someone I want to hear from? I'm quite interested actually personally to hear from Dov Moran, the right. guy that created the USB stick and right. disc on key. I mean, this is a guy that has sold his company for well over a billion dollars to SanDisk and has gone on to continue to innovate, to continue to create new companies, new IP, new patents. Mm -hmm. And I know he's only speaking for, I think, about 10 minutes, mm. but he'll be a very, personally, I think he'll be very interesting to hear from. Mm. Well, I, I um, would like to hear from, uh, from um, Mr. Uh, Kozlovsky, Nikolod mm. Kozlovsky, who is an expert on, on cyber security right. and uh, from Jerusalem Venture Partners, but less perhaps on the cyber uh, area and more on what he thinks and where he, is, where he stands on the his surveillance versus privacy mm -hmm. debate, which I think is taking over everywhere now. In the States, it's huge after the attacks in Paris. Mm -hmm. 
And here it's a ma major, major issue. And it's becoming also a U.S. election issue. Yeah. How much of you know of our WhatsApp and Facebook messages should governments be allowed to see? And you have Apple encrypting their iMessages, and then the ISIS terrorists going into encrypted messages like Telegram. Here is Mr. Kozlovsky, who's kind of seen seen it from the inside. And I, don't, mm. I haven't really heard too many experts in cybersecurity talk about you know backdoors to encryption, how mm. much privacy you know, uh, we, we should be giving up, or if at all, and maybe even the, si the, the security versus privacy balance, you know, is gone forever if, um, you know, if these attacks continue. Mm. So I would love to hear from him, you know, a view from the inside on, on that kind of debate. Mm. We're almost out of time, but I was going to ask you each to finish. I mean, what, what would you say is, you know, the next big thing? I mean, what, what is, you know, the next trend, in, in, you know, coming out of Israel that you think we should all be keeping our eyes on for the future. If we were going to buy stocks, you know, what, what is it? What is that thing going to be that none of us know about yet, but is about to make it big? Well, we touched on Biomed, but yeah. I, think, I think that um, not just in Israel, where there is a, 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 strong, a strong industry, but also worldwide, this, this um, burgeoning industry of genetic editing, yeah. of DNA editing, um, is you know on the one hand it's incredibly uh, technical mm. and you know very very um, complex and it's a little bit freaky also mm. because you know these 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 companies now they are actual companies that can take a swab of your saliva or a piece of your skin and then mm. kind of map out your DNA and see what's wrong and perhaps down the line you know tinker with it and then we're going into this whole area of designer mm. babies. Uh, um, you know all these things that okay i mean it would be fantastic to see more um talk uh and more light being shed on some of the ethical processes here mm. and the oversight because i think that that some people can really just you know get a, a huge venture capital boost from someone mm. and then go underground for a couple of years and come up with this incredible gene editing type of technology that you know really will surprise us all and i think that for me, that's one area to look at because I think it's happening very rapidly. Mm -hmm. And I think the other area that I'm particularly interested in watching from an Israeli perspective is that around kind of Bitcoin mm. and the whole, and blockchain, which is a whole new concept of financial technology, which has the potential to totally change the way the financial system works, cutting out the need for exchanges, cutting, making things instantaneous when you're transferring and buying and selling assets, as opposed to having to have clearing periods and so forth. And that I think if the banks embrace it, or maybe if the banks don't embrace it, it will just develop in its own right, mm -hmm. has huge potential to really change the entire way the back end of the financial system works. Mm -hmm. And there are some very, very smart people in Israel doing a lot in that area with a lot of deep expertise. And so... And is that about just having the, the good blockchain behind it? Or, or is that what else needs to be done to make it work? I think it's that technology. I mean, essentially, yeah. it's saying that this glass yeah. is can be bought and sold by trading a colored Bitcoin. This, yeah. And so that all needs to be built. That whole infrastructure mm. needs to be built in order to attach that kind of Bitcoin to a specific asset. Mm. And so, you know, it does need adoption and it will take time to come through. But I think it could be hugely disruptive. OK. Thank you both very much. That's been uh, very, very interesting. And we look forward to tomorrow's conference. So thank you both for joining me. Thank you. Yeah.